So we started with who does your hair, then who does your makeup. Uh, is it time for a facelift? Then this is our last one. Where, where do you buy your shoes? It's interesting that as I studied shoes, I, I like shoes, I really do. Uh, not quite as much as Deborah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people, when they visit our house, they think that there is a problem between us uh, because when you go into our bedroom, all the closets are filled with her stuff and her shoes. And they say, well, where's Scott's stuff and where's his, his shoes? Well, I get the closet at the end of the hallway in the guest room. And they, they, they just make an assumption that maybe we live separately in the house. That's not true. There's just no room for my stuff with her stuff. So uh, she has shoes that uh, she hasn't even visited in a year. I'm convincing her to bag them up and to give them to somebody. But when I looked at shoes and, and I, I was trying to get the history of shoes, when were the first shoes made and and everything. And of course, they go way, way back uh, into the Old Testament. Uh, people found ways to put stuff around their feet so that when they walked, they, they stepped on rocks and what have you, they wouldn't get hurt. But really, the first pair of shoes were, were really something. They were actually hard leather on the bottom, and they were wrapped in a bag of soft leather and tied around the ankle. They were really hideous looking. And the only reason we know that is that our, some architects found them frozen in ice. And when they dated them back, realized that they were, were one of the first pair of what we would call lace-up shoes ever made. But it's changed over history because now shoes have become a thing of fashion. It used to be your hair was the, the icon of fashion or the way that you dress. But now it's almost gravitated all the way down to our shoes. When I was growing up, shoes were not all that important. I mean, we wore sneakers in our day, and, and I forget the, the ones where they make you run faster and jump higher. Some of you will remember those. Uh, and then came the Convert All-Star. Those were the big hit, and they've now resurfaced again. Uh, but we didn't have the emphasis on shoes that we have today. I remember my father. My father owned two pair of shoes that... He always kept looking brand new. He wore those probably. In fact, I never remember my dad ever buying shoes. My whole life, I remember the two pair of shoes. How many of you know that if you buy something like what's on the, on the screen right now, wingtips will stand the test of time. Yes. They never go out. They never come back in. They just always are, right? And if you get a quality pair, you probably wear them the rest of your life. But shoes today have become a fashion statement. I mean, we have, we have Stacy's, we have Steve Madden's, we have Air Jordan's. You have high heels, you have open toes, you have boots, you have gaiters. I just lose track. There are just too many types and brands of shoes. And, 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 and I, I'm on the internet a lot during the day. And, and I saw an advertisement, these really cool shoes. And I said, yeah, that's me right there. Those shoes are me. I'm, I'm going to order those shoes. Until I opened it up and I scrolled down to the price and realized I was looking between $1,500 and about $2,500 pair of shoes. And I said, well, uh, they might be for me, but I'm not paying for them. So I'm going to wait for the cheaper version. But the, the funny thing is, is that, you know, when it comes to shoes, I think shoes are important because we all like our feet. Women today, I, I bet you almost every, every woman here, well, maybe not every, but a good many women today, y'all have pedicures. You like your feet so much that, that you go get them all shined up and you get uh, blue nails, pink nails, red nails, yellow nails. Purple nails, yeah, yeah. Hey, and, and some of you, you're so wild, you even get little rhinestones put on your toes. Just to, if, if the color's not enough, you've got to you got to get a decal or a rhinestone. Uh, and, and then you buy shoes that are open-toed shoes to show off your pedicure. <laughs> some of you have open-toed shoes today because you want everybody to know how nice your toes look. I mean, you paid good money for that, right? You got to show somebody. Some of you, you have closed-toed shoes, but you still have a pedicure, even though you always wear closed-toed shoes, because just in case 
one of your toes should ever be exposed, wow. you got to make sure it really looks nice. Amen, somebody. <laughs> but I'm going to give you three quick points, and the first point is, is no matter how pretty your feet are, they stink. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I knew something was funny about you. You've got stinky feet. You've got some stinky feet. <laughs> You see, I can prove it to you because those of you that go get pedicures, I'll, I'll prove it to you. That's why that guy or that gal wears a mask. <laughs> they, they make it, they play it off when they can't get the filing and the dust and all of that in the air. But no, 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 no. They have a mask on for a reason. It's because you've got stinky feet, okay? I mean, that's just the bottom line. So I found out where stinky feet comes from. Because no matter who you are, everybody has it. Stinky feet, let me just read some stuff. Stinky feet comes from sweat. And sweat is odorless. I didn't know that. I, I thought sweat had an odor. Sweat is odorless, but it, it creates an environment for bacteria to grow. And it's the bacteria growth that causes a bad smell. In fact, it's called brevetaria. And that feeds off the dead skin on the feet, which produces amino acid methanine, and that turns into methanol, which is a colorless gas with a smell. That's where your stinky feet come from. It is a colorless gas with a smell. So your feet have a gas. But it's funny because the Bible says, the Bible even concurs that we all stink. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, Isaiah prophesies and he says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags, and we shrivel as a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. So as I thought about it, I thought, you know, if, if our righteousness is as filthy rags, I, I, I was thinking about filthy rags because uh, we had a rag the other week where I cleaned up uh, uh, some mess. Our dog made a mess and I cleaned it up and I looked at that rag and I said, that's not even worth washing. I am just going to throw it away. I'm not even going to try to clean this. I'm going to throw it away. Because if I clean it, I'll always know what was on it. And I ain't going to touch it again, so I'm going to get rid of it and find another rag. But Isaiah says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Now, we talk a lot about how good we are and, 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 and the, the achievements that we've made. And, and I get that, and that is all good. But, but as I thought about this, I, I thought, you know, no matter how good I am, and no matter what I do and the accomplishments I have, no matter what they are, deep down, seated in me is a dirty rag. My righteousness, my righteousness as, is as filthy rag. So I, I, just, I just decided that I was going to bring a filthy rag and illustrate this for you. This, this is what your righteousness looks like, okay? And, and I don't think anybody should touch this because you don't want to know what's on there. But this is what our righteousness looks like. When everything is stripped away, see, I, I can look good today. I can have a great shirt on. Uh, but underneath this shirt, I, there is another shirt. There is a shirt like this. And you all don't see this underneath this shirt because this shirt could look like this and you'd never know it. You'd never know it. But I know it. <laughs> I know what my righteousness is like. God knows what my righteousness is like. And he's saying, it is as filthy rags. So when I look at this and I go, that's as good as I can get. If that's as good as I can get, there's very little hope for me. If this is as good as it gets, there's very little hope. Except for one thing. Because of Jesus Christ, though I look like this, because of Jesus Christ, God only sees this. That's right. Amen. You see, God has selective vision. Mm -hmm. When he looks at you, you know, I don't ignore the bad. I, I'm a realist. I don't ignore those bad things. I don't ignore my faults. I'm not going to get up here and tell you I have no faults. 
I'm not going to get up here and tell you I look like this because I know I don't. I truly look like this. I've got some spaghetti. I've got some mustard. I've got some barbecue sauce. It never made my mouth. It made the shirt. But when God looks at me, he sees this. And that's called grace. So, so how do we deal with this? Am I stuck in this? How do we deal with this? What, what do I do? How, how do I get away from this? Paul said it this way. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. I'm, I'm a wretched man. This is the Apostle Paul. I'm a wretched man because the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. I'm getting so confused. I'm just a wretched mess because I don't want to do this stuff, but a lot of times I do. So how do I deal with the dirty rag man? How do I do with that wretched guy? How do I deal with him? You see, here's the problem. You see, a lot of times that t-shirt, because it's been worn so much, is comfortable. I, I, sometimes the wretched guy, because I know him so well, there's a certain level of comfort. I, I like this. I've worn it for so long, after all, I've, I've, I've lived in it for months. It's okay, I like it. I've gotten used to it, and I like it. There, there's another, there's something else that happens. You see, you can wear it so much that you no longer see the stains. Wow. wow. You never realize, you no longer see how dirty it is because it's not being compared to this. You see, if you only compare this with other things like it, you don't notice it truly how dirty it is until you come up against something like this. Uh -huh. But then all of a sudden you give your heart to the Lord and, and you become what we call a Christian and you start walking what is called the way. That's what it was in the New Testament. It was called the walk the way, the way of Christ. And we begin to walk that way and God begins to show us more and more of this. This is what you are like. And we see it in the Word when we read the Word and, we, and all of a sudden we realize, yeah, I've been living in it and I've gotten used to it. And, and, and I don't see the state anymore, but all of a sudden it becomes alive to us, and we see it, and we know it, and we go, God, how can you see us like this? What do I do about this? How do I uh, uh, direct my, how do I change it, Lord? I, I don't know what to do. Is it all that hopeless? But God gives us the key to changing this. Now, there are churches all over America that are telling people, white knuckle it. Just don't do it anymore. I, I, I mean, people waxing eloquent. Just don't sin anymore. But I'm here to tell you, you are. Well, just don't go drink anymore. You tell that to an alcoholic, he's going to go right out and drink again. Well, well, just don't do this and just don't do that. And, and stay away from this and stay away. That all sounds good. But if deep down I am a dirty rag and my righteousness is a filthy rag, that's not going to change because I white knuckle it and I with determination say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Oh gosh, I might as well go do it. You see, because that's what people do. All, across, all Christians across America. But God gives a key. He says in Matthew, Jesus said in chapter 6 and verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. See, first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Okay, it's all in what you are seeking. So if I replace seeking the things that cause this and I begin to seek the kingdom and I begin to seek his righteousness and I seek after this, though God sees me this way, as I seek it, I become it. Because while I'm seeking this, I can't be seeking that. Are you with me? If my heart is here, and I'm, my drive is here, and I'm, and I'm plugged into the things of God, while I'm seeking this, this begins to diminish. And it no longer controls my life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him. So the more, you got to get this. Because if you don't, you don't change. The more I become in him, 
the more I become like him. Now, I can go to church, and I can sing a bunch of songs, and I can listen to a good message, and I can go home, and, and, and I can never attempt to be in him, because the righteousness is in him. So how do I change? How do I get rid of this old, decrepit nature that is destroying it? How do I change? I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I hunger and I and I seek it out and I'm and I'm going for it. I, I I'm getting his word and I'm in, and I'm and I'm praying. I'm spending time with him. I'm saying, you know, to seek something is an activity. You don't seek something passively. You got to get busy and you got to get to it. That's how you seek something. I'm seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as I become in him, I become like him. And pretty soon, that old man, that, that unrighteous man, that man who, as dirty rags, simply begins to diminish. There is still an unrighteousness someplace, but it is no longer seen and visible because I've been engulfed by Jesus Christ and his righteousness. The second thing is, talking about shoes. I, I was in a meeting yesterday that uh, some of us went to, and the speaker, uh, the speaker was sharing about the smell of God, that, that there are smells in heaven, and uh, told the story about a gentleman in the airport uh, who had one day been blessed with smelling something in heaven while he was, I think, in prayer. And he's running through the airport. And as he's running through the airport, he, uh, he stops and he sets his bags down. He tells his wife, I'll be right back. And he runs back down the, the aisle way and he comes to a man and he greets him and he gives him a big hug and, uh, and, uh, and they share some words for a minute. And then he runs back, he grabs his bag and they continue on to the plane. And the wife asked him, said, what were you doing? He said, well, while we were going through the airport, there was a smell I recognized. And I remember I smelled that same smell while I was in prayer. And I had to go back and greet the man that had the same smell. You see, when you are in him and his righteousness begins to engulf your life, there is a certain odor of sweetness that your life produces. When you're not in him, and you're not seeking the kingdom, and you're not seeking his righteousness, that dirty rag produces an odor too. And pretty soon, all people smell is your dirty rag. But when you're in him, there's an odor that you produce. It's a kingdom odor, and people are sensitive to that, and they begin to detect that you are in him. The second thing is, do you buy cheap or expensive shoes? Everybody knows that cheap shoes won't last. Is it leather or is it leather? I realized, I learned earlier on how to tell an expensive quality pair of shoes. And it's all in the stitching. In fact, if you look at your shoes, it's called a welt. These shoes I've had for a long, long time, and they're very expensive shoes. And if you look around the sole part of the shoe, you'll see that there is a stitching that goes around it. That stitching, if you go to a shoe shop, they'll tell you that that stitching is called a welt. That is the welt of the shoe. Now, for it to be a good welt and for it to be a proper welt, it has to run through to the bottom of the sole and come back up again. So in theory, you should be able to look at the bottom of your shoes and you should be able to see stitching around the bottom, the outside edge of the shoe. That means you've got a good welt. That means the stitching has run all the way through and come back up. But you see, even though I paid a lot of money for these shoes, and it appears to have a wealth that is a fake wealth. 
I didn't know that when I bought them. It, it's a fake welt. In fact, a lot of cheap shoes have a pretend welt, so they look like they're an expensive shoe, but in, in reality, they're a cheap shoe. The problem is, is that when you have a, a cheap shoe or you have a shoe with a fake welt, the problem is this, and this happened to me with this pair of shoes. In fact, it happened to me with this shoe. I hate this shoe. <laughs> Service is getting ready to start, and I'm walking from the back, and the welt let go, and the sole began to flap, and the shoe <laughs> came apart. I said, I felt it going clippity cloppity, clippity clop. I'm going, what the heck is that? And I looked at it, and my sole is hanging, and I said, oh my gosh, I can't do this. So fortunately, I had just enough time. I ran back to the apartment, got another pair of shoes, and came back, and nobody knew. And, and so I took it to the shoe guy, and I said, you got to do something, man. These are too expensive to throw away. He said, well, I'll glue it again, and you'll be okay. So he glued it. About a month later, I'm wearing the shoe again, and, and, and service is starting. That's the devil. They couldn't have done it way before. It has to do it. With certain, you know, and I'm walking from the back, and there it goes, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. And I looked out, and I go, it did it again. So I go back, and I said, man, that glue did not hold. He said, that's the best glue we've got. He said, I, he said, the problem is, is that your shoe has no welt. It's depending on glue, and glue won't last forever. I said, can you put a welt on the shoe? Is there enough room for you to stitch it? And he said, yeah, I, I can stitch it, maybe. He said, I'll give it a try in an attempt to save the shoe, but, but I cannot promise. Well, he was successful. He stitched it, and now I get to wear them for a few more years. Uh, I still am a little bit afraid because, because when something like that happens, you don't really forget it. And every time I wear them, I'm thinking, is he going to do it again? Is it? You know. it, it always happens at the very worst time. You know, it couldn't do it before I'm leaving. It's got to do it when I'm there. And so I don't wear them that much. See, to me, the wealth is like the Word of God. It has to go through and it has to touch the soul. That's good. That's good. If it doesn't touch the soul, it will never hold it together. Amen. If it doesn't touch the soul, it is a fake wealth. And you can have a lot of fake wealth all day and all night, but eventually it is going to let go. Eventually it will let go when you need it the most. The wealth has got to go through the soul and come back up. Let me read in Psalms 119 and verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The reason I don't do certain things and the reason I don't commit certain sin it is simply because I've hidden God's word in my heart. And I've hidden his word in my heart to the extent that it has gone down and it has touched my soul. And when it has touched your soul, it will never, ever let go. It changes you. The Word of God will change you. If you get into His Word and you let it touch your soul, it will change you. It will change you without you doing anything. Can I say that again? That sounds unchristian. But it will change you without you doing one thing. Because it has stitched your soul and it has united and put you together so that it will never let go. But if you don't, and your wealth is not good and your wealth is not there and it has not touched your soul, you'll hold together for a while. But at the wrong time, the right place, whatever it is, the devil will come along and you will let go, and your soul will let go, and you'll just be flopping, and you'll be useless mm. because you are not stitched. If I can hammer one thing this morning, I, I, 
You've got to get into God's Word. You've got to get into God's Word. You've got to let His Word permeate your soul. You've got to let Him stitch you together. Sometimes it's just reading His Word as He speaks to you through it. Sometimes He is doing something in you through His Word that you don't even know He's doing. Because the Word is living. It's like that shoemaker, the craftsman, as he works on the shoe. And he's stitching it, and he's mending it, and he's healing it, and he's shining it, and he's fixing it. That's what the Word of God does every time you open that book and you begin to read it. You might not walk away and say, you know what, I didn't feel anything. But something, I promise you, has happened deep within you because he has added another stitch or two. He has put something back together. And sometimes you walk away and you go, I felt something happen to me. I don't know what it was, but I felt something happen to me. That's because you felt the stitching going on. But every time you open that book, stitching is happening nonetheless. I'd rather hang with somebody that is all stuffed up and doesn't, isn't shiny at all, but they've got a good stitching, they've got a good welt. Because if they've got a good welt, I know that they will never leave me high and dry. I know that they are, they'll be consistent. Those are the people you need to run with. You need to run with people with a good welt. Look at your neighbor, look at their shoes. Do they have a good welt or are they fake? <laughs> They're fake, you might want to move over a chair. I'm not running with you anymore. The last point. Always follow the guy with the good shoes. Always follow the guy with the good shoes. Deborah told me when we were dating, she said, I can always tell a good man by the shoes he wears. Mm -hmm. I looked down and said, thank God I've got my best shoes on today. <laughs> I went home and I took all the ones that didn't look so good and I got rid of them right away. But I believe there's some truth in that. You see, I think people that buy cheap shoes, they kind of compromise. Now, I understand when you can't afford, you buy what you can afford. I get that. I get that. If you can't afford expensive, you don't buy expensive. But I'm talking about people that can afford something that don't go buy it, and they go buy something cheap. You see, I think that when you, when you buy something cheap, you're compromising. That's like people. I think people sometimes compromise. I think when you buy something expensive and there's a good wealth, there is no compromise. I want to be around people that don't compromise. I want to be around people that don't compromise their belief. You know where they stand. I want to be around people that don't compromise their convictions. I want to be around people that don't compromise their love. Have you ever met somebody that loves you one day and the next day you wonder if they do? And you don't even know what you said to cause it? That's a cheap shoe. Mm. But if they've got a good will, they don't compromise. I want to be around people that don't compromise their praise. Mm. Yeah. How do you know a person compromises their praise? They only praise when it feels right. You know when God asked us to praise Him, He did so not, not stating it was based on how you felt. Mm -hmm. You don't praise God because you feel right about it. Can I go a step further? You don't praise God just because you're in church. Sometimes you've got to wake up on the worst day, in the worst mood, on the wrong side of the bed, and say, today, I am going to praise God. I am going to start my day by thanking Him for it. Thanking Him for everything He's done in my life. Thanking Him for everything He's done in my life. And you'll see how quickly things change. Because when you don't compromise, somehow God always comes through. 
I got depressed the other the other week, and, and I was singing a very sad song, and 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 the Lord just stopped me one day as I was singing the blues and, and all of that. God said, God stopped me. He said, He said, I want you to make a list of all the things you should be thankful for. Make a list of all the things I've done in your life. Make a list and then come cry to me. And I got to about item number three and I was praising and worshiping the Lord because I realized there is absolutely nothing to be depressed about. God has truly blessed. There is nothing to be down about. God has truly blessed. I want to be around people that don't compromise their forgiveness. Their forgiveness is not contingent. They forgive because Jesus forgave. Those are the kind of people that I want to hang with and I want to be around. You know, Brett sent me a text uh, this last week. We were talking about another ministry in town that made the paper. And, uh, uh, and, and Brett sent me a text because Brett had been there. And Brett said, how can, how can they be doing what they're doing when they are so fake and and he went on to say some other things about them. Oh, I know what it was. They had pulled a gun on them. That's what it was. The, the wow. pastor had pulled a gun on them. No. And, uh, and it, triggered, it triggered a conversation I had with Brett way back when he first came. And, and uh, we, we got to know each other. And he, his story was that this pastor had pulled a gun on him. Got a man had pulled a gun on him. And, and so, so I, I'm remembering that. And, and we're talking. And, and then he sends me this text. He says... Is it, is it against the law to be a phony preacher? And I had to think about it because I thought it should be. It should be against the law. But I, I, I came to the conclusion, no, it's not against the law at all. It's not against the law to be phony. There are a lot of phony people. In fact, people can look good. They can have Stacy's and Gators they can have all of that. You can look like a Stacy Adams shoe, but when I look at your welt, if that welt is not there, and I look at the bottom, the soul, and I don't see it come through, you're nothing more than a knockoff. That's all you are. It's phony, that's, phony, that's phony, deep. phony. And eventually you're going to split apart. Eventually you're going to come unglued. Eventually you're going to come apart from the soul, and eventually you get thrown in the trash. Wow. Now I can link that last statement to a whole lot of parables that Jesus said about being worthless and thrown in the trash. Dead branches. You see, here's the thing. We have some folks this morning that have been serving God for a long time. That don't mean you have a good wealth. You can have a fake wealth, and you can be nothing more than an older knockoff. I've been a Christian for a long time. That don't mean nothing. You're just now an old knockoff. Eventually, you're going to break. You could have just given your heart to the Lord today. You could be brand new and there's already good stitching going on because you're pursuing God. Even in your newness, you're pursuing God. There is already a hunger deposited in you. I've watched some people in the back, standing in the back. I've watched some new guys, new guys, praising God and worshiping God with abandonment. And when I saw that, I said, God, there's stitching going on right now. You're stitching a wealth in them that's never going to let go. Then I saw some people that I know have been serving God for some time. I don't need this. Uh, when's it going to be over? I don't need this worship. Be careful. Age doesn't determine the quality of the wealth. The price of the shoe doesn't mean nothing. That's an expensive shoe with a fake wealth. I didn't know better because I saw the fake and thought it was real. I didn't know to look on the bottom. 
This shoe is not so expensive, but it's got a real welt. And I can wear this out, and it'll never let go. So how's your welt? Where do you buy your shoes? That's what we got to ask ourselves. Are we going for quality? Is that what we want in our life, quality? It's all in the wealth. Doesn't matter the style of the shoe. It doesn't matter whether it's open toe, closed toe. Doesn't matter whether it's a boot. It doesn't matter. It's all in the wealth. Look at the wealth. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand together. And we're going to close. <coughs> you may be here today, and you might realize that you're running with people that have fake wealths. And you've got to make a decision to break some of those relationships. You might be here today and you might realize that I, 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 I don't know that I have a wealth at all. <clears throat> well, it's time to start. Find some time to open the Bible and let him begin to stitch all the way to your soul. That's how we change our righteousness as dirty rags. That's how you deal with stinky feet. As you get into the word of God, he will change you. It's not about you changing you. Can, can I just get somebody to agree you can't change you? Amen. 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 I, I, can, I can get you to suit up for church all day long. You can come in looking real pretty. But when you take your shoes off, you still stink. Okay? All right? Only God, only God can change the righteousness as we delve into him and we become engulfed in him and then pretty soon people don't smell the stinkiness they smell the sweetness maybe you need to do that today maybe you need to make a decision I'm going to begin to delve into God like never before Father thank you thank you for your word Lord I pray that as we're getting ready to wrap up this morning we're getting ready uh, to leave, Lord, that your Holy Spirit reach deep within our heart. Lord, show us a picture of who we are. Show us a picture of who we are. Lord, not, not, not to leave us in a place of discouragement, but show us it where we are right now, Lord. Father, I pray that you will challenge us by way of your Holy Spirit. You will challenge us, Lord. You will challenge us to have our stitching done better. You will challenge us to get wrapped up into the righteousness of Christ so that the old man and all of the stinkiness doesn't rule our life. You will challenge us to get into your word and to allow the stitching to go deep into our soul that can change us, that can hold us together, that can keep us consistent and constant. <coughs> That you will challenge us today, Lord, that as we leave, that this will be a new day with new changes in our life. In Jesus' powerful, powerful name, amen. 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 If you believe it, so amen.